My name is Bob Newton, and I'm a special assistant to the president of Boston College, Father Bill Leahy, and I'm also the interim director of the, the Church in the 21st Century Center, which is the sponsor of this event. The center's theme this semester is, uh, as you probably know, uh, the Eucharist at the center of Catholic life. And uh, this issue has a, a rich collection of articles on the Eucharist developing that theme. And we've also, I think, developed an outstanding uh, set of on-campus programs uh, that reaffirm the same theme. Uh, it's my duty, which is, I must say, also a pleasure, to uh, introduce tonight's speaker, Father John Baldwin. Father Baldwin is a New York province Jesuit uh, who is also the professor of historical and liturgical theology at the Weston Jesuit School of Theology. He's, a, he's an alumnus of the College of the Holy Cross, uh, of the old Weston Jesuit School of Theology when it was in, I guess it was in Cambridge when you got your MDiv. And he has three graduate degrees from Yale University, including his PhD. Father Baldwin has taught at Fordham. He's taught at the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley and uh, began in 1999 to teach at the Weston Jesuit School of Theology which is now uh, affiliated, reaffiliated, and part of the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry, opened only three years ago. He served on practically all the important advisory committees on the liturgy uh, that, that uh, exist here and, and uh, internationally, and received the Baraka Award for Distinguished Achievement from the North American Academy for Liturgy. Father uh, Baldwin has published on liturgy widely, including in journals like uh, Worship, Theological Studies, America, and Commonweal. His writings have been translated into French, German, Spanish, Japanese, and last but not least, Albanian, for those of you who speak Albanian or read Albanian. His latest books are The uh, Living Bread, Saving Cup, Understanding the Mass, published in 2003, and Reforming the Liturgy, A Response to the Critics, published in 2008. He's co-edited a commentary on the revised order of mass, which will be uh, published by Liturgical Press in just a few weeks. One of the substantial benefits that the reaffiliation of Western Jesuit School of Theology with Boston College to form a new school of theology and ministry. One of the, the many benefits of that re reaffiliation has been the wealth of uh, talent and expertise that has come to Boston College in this move. Uh, nowhere is this more obvious, I think, than in our church in the 21st century collaboration with uh, Father Baldwin. Uh, not only did he edit the current issue of C21 resources on the Eucharist, uh, but in a moment of generosity this summer, uh, some might say foolhardiness, he agreed to edit the spring issue of C21 resources, which will be entitled Catholics, a Sacramental People. We thank Father Baldwin for all that he's done uh, and all that he will do uh, in, in pursuit of the church in the 21st century mission to be a resource and a catalyst for the renewal of the church. Uh, we welcome here tonight, him here tonight to speak on the Eucharist from the New Testament to Benedict XVI, how it has changed, how it has remained the same. Father Baldwin. Thank you, Bob. Now you have some sense uh, not only of who I am, but 
also of Bob, uh, Bob and Karen Kiefer, his assistants, uh, Persuasive Powers. So, um, I'm delighted, uh, good afternoon everybody, I'm delighted to be with you uh, all this afternoon to, to speak about the uh, Eucharist, which as uh, Bob noted, our recent Church 21 resources uh, claims is the center of our Catholic lives. Of course the Eucharist is at the center of our lives because Christ is at the center of our lives. And Christ is the center of the Eucharist. My plan this afternoon is to concentrate on how both the celebration of the Eucharist has changed and remained the same. Both true statements, I hope you'll be convinced by the end of the presentation, has remained the, the same and changed over the last 2,000 years. Uh, I'll start with a little slide of the cover of our, this wonderful cover of uh, our recent issue, the uh, great Caravaggio Supper at Emmaus, which hangs in the National Gallery in London. I'm going to give several snapshots of the celebration of the Eucharist down through the centuries, and they are just snapshots. Uh, since they tell so much of the tale, I'll be using some representations of church plans and of the Mass as visual aids. Let's start with the first real description. And there's the outline of the, uh, the five snapshots you'll get. The second century, Justin Martyr, the early fifth century in Rome, uh, the 13th century in England, the early 20th century, you see there are great leaps and bounds here. And then of course the late 20th century, the current situation. We'll start with the first real description we get uh, of the celebration of the Eucharist from the middle of the second century. A philosopher and convert to Christianity named Justin, later named Justin Martyr, wrote a public defense of the Christian faith to the emperor Antoninus Pius. In it, he described the simplicity of Christian worship, presumably because detractors, the enemies of Christianity, had been making so many wild accusations. They cook babies and eat them, things like that. Here are two brief descriptions that Justin gives. The first uh, is a Eucharist that follows a baptism. The second, the ordinary uh, Sunday assembly. Here's the baptism. After we have thus washed someone who has been convinced and has assented to our teaching, we bring him to the place where those who are called brothers and sisters are assembled in order that we may offer hearty prayers in common for ourselves and for the baptized person, and for all others in every place that we may be counted worthy now that we have learned the truth. By our works also, to be found good citizens and keepers of the commandments, so that we may be saved with an everlasting salvation. Having ended the prayers, we salute one another with a kiss. So as you can tell, after the baptism, what's happening is that there's a uh, the prayer, what we'd call the prayers of the faithful today, and then the kiss of peace in a different position than it ends up in our liturgy. There is then, he continues in this uh, description of the post-baptismal Eucharist, there is then brought to the president of the assembly bread and a cup of wine mixed with water. And he, the president of the assembly, taking them gives praise and glory to the Father of the universe through the name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and offers thanks at considerable length for our being counted worthy to receive these things at his hands. And when he has concluded the prayers and thanksgivings, we would call the Eucharistic prayer, all the people present express their assent by saying, Amen. Then those who are called deacons give to each of those present to partake of the bread and wine mixed with water over which the thanksgiving, the Eucharistic prayer, was pronounced. And to those who are absent, they carry away a portion. Next description, rather brief. And on the day they call Sunday, all who live in the cities or in the country gather together in one place. And the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read. So obviously the New Testament, what we'd call today the New Testament and the Old Testament. As long as time permits. When the reader has ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. Then we all rise together and pray, prayers of the faithful, 
And as we said before, when our prayer is ended, bread and wine and water are brought, and the president in like manner offers prayers and thanksgivings according to his ability. The, uh, the bishop who presided at the Eucharist at this time uh, probably used a structure for the Eucharistic prayer, which he filled in uh, ad lib. Uh, we don't trust priests to do that today. And the people assent saying, amen. And there is distribution to each and a participation of that over which thanks has been given. And to those who are absent, a portion is sent by the deacons. And he concludes in this way, and I think a very important note, uh, because sometimes people end at that point with the description of the Eucharist. But I think this is essential. And they who are well-to-do and willing give, to, uh, give wh what each thinks fit, and what is collected is deposited with the president, who helps the orphans and widows and those who through sickness or any other cause are in want, and those who are in prison and the strangers living among us, and in a word, takes care of all those who are in need. In other words, it was obvious to them that the Eucharist also meant that, that you extended this celebration of, of the gift of Christ uh, to others who are absent uh, or who are in need. Uh, here in the middle of the second century, we can see the outline of the basic elements that make up our celebration of the Eucharist even today. Readings from the scriptures, prayers of the faithful, the exchange of peace, presentation of the gifts, the Eucharistic prayer, Holy Communion, and communion for the sick and gifts for the poor. The slide on the screen is a fairly good example. You can see where I have the red dot there. A fairly good example, and our only pre fourth century example, real pre-fourth century example, of what we'd call a house church, the kind of place that Christians would have gathered. And you see on the, on the right is what was presumably a baptistry with a tub or font at the end, richly decorated. In the middle, the usual courtyard of the middle of a, of a Roman or Mediterranean house. Uh, the room there, some people think, was used for catechetical instruction, perhaps. And here's the room where the Eucharist would have taken place. Interestingly enough, a wall had been broken down here in the middle. They found in the excavations, a wall had been broken down in the middle to make this a larger room uh, so that a larger group of people could gather. And this is the kind of room that people would have gathered for the kind of Eucharistic celebration uh, that I just uh, shared with you. Let's turn now to the fifth century, this time to uh, on the screen, you can see the four floor plan of a typical 5th century Roman basilica, Santa Sabina, on top of the Aventine Hill. It's the mother house now of the Dominican order, uh, where the Pope celebrates Mass on Ash Wednesday to begin Lent. With the legalization of Christianity in the 4th century came a number of logical changes. Now, large open rooms were used. They're called basilicas and they were adopted from civic Roman public spaces. Sometimes, like at St. Peter's in the Vatican, they were built over the tombs of martyrs. So you see a long space, the nave there with two aisles. In this area is where the choir would have been, and here you'll see uh, are the two pulpits from which the scriptures are read, and then up here the altar, and up here uh, at, the, uh, cord of, at the head of the apse, sorry, um, the uh, chair for the presider, right? It would be surrounded, a bishop surrounded by the presbyters on either side. Now, here's the interior of that church, uh, at least a, uh, a sketch of, the, of what it might have looked like. Uh, you can't really see the ambos or the, uh, the uh, pulpits uh, from here, but they still exist uh, today. So you can see the typical example here of what today we'd call a sanctuary, a fifth century Roman sanctuary. The, the rails would have held in the choir. Here's one version where there's only one ambo. You have the seat for the bishop and the, and the priests, the presbyters in the back, and then uh, a small altar with a table for the rest of the uh, offerings because, of course, um, there were multiple cups, etc., that needed to be filled for uh, people's communion. Uh, as you can imagine, the change in the scale of the celebration led to a good deal of change in the liturgy itself. Now, a psalm was chanted by a choir during the entrance of the bishop. 
The presentation of the gifts became an elaborate affair with the bishop receiving the gifts, first from the men's side, then from the women's side, at Rome, anyway, up north across the Alps, there was an offertory procession. In the course of the fourth century, the Lord's Prayer had been added to the end of the Eucharistic prayer as a way of preparing for Holy Communion, especially to make us worthy, forgive us uh, our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And now chants of the Psalms, and sometimes other scripture pieces, not just Psalms, accompanied both the offertory rites and the communion procession. You can see on the next slide an ivory from Germany in the eighth century that ministers and people still surround the priest at the altar. Here's an even better representation from a ninth century sacramentary cover, the so-called Drogo uh, sacramentary. Normally, altars faced east, the rising sun, uh, but they were, altars were freestanding. So it seems that people were arranged in different places. We don't know exactly how. I'd like to include a fe feature of the Roman liturgy in particular that I think illustrates the early Christian understanding of the Eucharist rather well. I'm referring to a practice called the fermentum. Fermentum. You know that the priest adds a particle of the consecrated host to the chalice immediately following the fraction rite of the Mass during the singing of the Lamb of God. This practice seems to have originated in Rome where the bishop, that is the Pope, uh, celebrated the main Sunday Eucharist. And during the fraction rite, pieces of the consecrated bread, Eucharistic bread, were put into sacks and carried by acolytes to the neighborhood churches where priests were celebrating, presbyters were celebrating. Those pieces of bread were placed in the cup at those churches so that all might understand that they were celebrating the same Eucharist together with the bishop, the pope, wherever they were in the city. My point is that these early Christians had a robust sense of what it means to celebrate in union with Christ, both individually and as the body of Christ a community. Now we're going to skip about 800 years and jump a couple of thousand miles and travel north to England in the 13th century. Our first slide shows the famous Westminster Abbey. Uh, let me note here that you can see that there is a kind of church within a church. You've seen this on TV if you watch all those royal weddings and funerals and things like that. Um, there's a kind of church within the church. That's where the choir is and where most of the important ceremonies take place, the coronation of a king or queen, et cetera. The, the choir is set off from the rest of the church so that the monks could pray the liturgy of the hours and probably, and practically, uh, so that a more confined space could be heated during the cooler months. The next slide shows a typical Gothic cathedral, this time the uh, famous Salisbury Cathedral, great Salisbury Cathedral that you know from its a great tower, quite striking. It's in Wilshire, south southwest of London. Notice the elongated choir, Look how long it is. Today there's no choir screen there. That was uh, torn down during the unpleasantness we call the English Reformation. Um, and, uh, but, and so they left it uh, torn down. But it's very striking as a church. Um, now, um, a, not a great deal happened in terms of the structure, the basic structure of the liturgy uh, between the 5th century and the 13th. Uh, the Nicene Creed was added on Sundays during the 10th century, and somehow the prayer of the faithful disappeared from the Mass. We don't know exactly how or why. But a great many changes took place in practice. And here's a quick list. painting of the Mass of St. Gregory, taken from the 15th century. I think it's a Spanish painting. Uh, here, here's a very quick list of the changes. So not, not much in terms of the structure of the liturgy, but think of these changes and what they meant. Uh, the, the Eucharistic prayer becomes silent by the 9th century. The same century, uh, people stop re receiving communion in the hand and receive communion on the tongue. Uh, the liturgy remained in Latin, which became a foreign language uh, for the vast majority of people. Uh, instead of looking like a table, 
a freestanding table, the altar migrated to the back wall of the church and further and further away from the assembled faithful, especially in churches like Salisbury Cathedral with those elongated choirs. During the 11th century, for the first time, uh, we know that the priest touched the gifts during the institution narrative, and during the 13th century, lifted them up uh, during the uh, Eucharistic prayer after the consecration. During the 11th century as well, uh, we find that uh, leavened bread is abandoned for unleavened bread. The next century, the 12th, uh, we have bells at the Sanctus, the Holy, 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 and at the consecration, presumably so that people could know when they were happening, because by, by visually, they probably couldn't see them, right? Uh, a side note, the first time I really understood this was in a town of, in the Alps in uh, northern Italy, uh, when the men who were smoking uh, on the outside of the church heard the bells for the Sanctus and came in for the... Uh, for the consecration. This was a way for them to note that they had to, they put their cigarettes down and then they came in, into the church. Um, in the 13th century, we have the legislation of communion at least once a year, at least once a year. Uh, the same century, as I mentioned, the elevation of the host at the consecration. Chalice doesn't get elevated because uh, you can't see what's in the chalice and uh, that's only done after Luther introduces it in the 16th century. Uh, during that same century, we have kneeling, the introduction of kneeling during the Eucharistic prayer, and finally, the loss of the cup, uh, giving communion under both kinds in the 13th century. You can guess that these developments signaled the gradual distancing of the gathered lay people from the clergy who were doing most of the active things in the liturgy. Not that the, the lay people didn't recognize, in the words of one church historian, John Bossy, that the most important thing that could happen in the universe was happening at the altar. They knew that. God was becoming present to them, sacramentally. They certainly knew that. But at the same time, I'd, I'd suggest that they lost any palpable sense that the Eucharist meant that they, the church, were becoming part of the body of Christ, corporately part of the body of Christ. A sense you saw, for example, that uh, was quite clear in that practice of the fermentum uh, in uh, early medieval Rome. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over the changes introduced by the Reformation, uh, which were mostly uh, in music and ceremonial during the Counter-Reformation and Baroque period, and conclude with a consideration of the reform of the Eucharistic liturgy undertaken by Pope Paul VI and the Catholic Church after the Second Vatican Council. But first, I want to read you a description of what an ordinary Mass was like at the beginning of the 20th century. It gets you a sense of why they did the reform. Here's a good picture of it. The description comes from a, a Belgian Benedictine named Dom Bernard Bott, Dom Bernard Bott was a fine liturgical scholar who worked in Belgium at uh, Louvain, famous university, in the first part of the 20th century and was very active uh, around the time of the council as well. Uh, he's recalling his youth at a bo boarding school. Here's what he says about mass when he was a kid. Every morning at eight o'clock there was a mass. This is not too different from the mass that I would attend when I was a kid in, in, uh, in seventh and eighth grade uh, in the 1950s. Every morning at eight o'clock, there was a mass in the student's chapel. Up front, there was only one altar in a little apse located between two sacristies. The mass was said by an old, more or less voiceless priest. Even in the first row, the only thing you'd hear was a murmur. Uh, the group rose for the gospel, but nobody dreamed of telling us what gospel it was. You could lose yourself in any prayer book at all, but we were pulled out of our drowsiness from time to time by the recitation of a few decades of the rosary, or by the singing of either a Latin motet or a French hymn. Receiving communion at this mass was out of the question. Fascinating. Receiving communion at this mass was out of the question. For that matter, no one at the time seemed to notice a relationship between the mass and communion. When one of my sisters asked the advice of the dean of the upper end of Charlois, 
Monsignor Lalieu, a doctor of theology and an author of a book on the mass, an author of a book on, on the mass, about the best time to receive communion, he recommended she receive before mass and then offer mass in Thanksgiving for communion. This, which was not terribly different from what happened when I was a grammar school kid and one of the priests came out of the sacristy, went to the auxiliary tabernacle, got the blessed sacrament and started giving us communion while mass continued, while the priest continued with mass. This sounds strange to us, says Bott, but we ought to keep in mind the ideas then current. Mass was no longer the prayer of the Christian community. The clergy prayed entirely in place of and in name of the community. As a result, the faithful were only remotely involved and paid attention to their own personal devotion. Communion appeared to be a private devotion without any special link to the Mass. Now, just in case you had nostalgia. Now it was the, this, this kind of situation that the reforms initiated by Vatican II was meant to address. I know that you can find beautiful examples of solemn high Masses, not very far from here in Newton, uh, in the so-called extraordinary form that you can find them today either if you're willing to get in a car uh, on a Sunday morning or skillful enough to negotiate YouTube on the internet. But for the vast majority of people, most of the time, uh, what Bott described was much closer to their experience. Now you can see from the three church interiors, these are three contemporary post-Vatican II church interiors. You can see from these three church interiors that I've chosen to put on the screen that much has changed in terms of the ethos and style of Catholic liturgy from that description I gave you from Bernard Butt. Probably the two most significant changes to come with the post-Vatican II reform were the translation of the liturgy into modern languages and the provision that the priest be able to face the people across the altar while presiding at mass. Nobody ever made a rule about that, but the rule is that each church, the main altar, must be a freestanding altar so that this could happen. In addition, of course, the use of various ministers for different aspects of liturgy, what I call a team sport, huh? the deacon, cantor, ministers of communion, uh, not to mention the restoration of the cup to the faithful, have helped us to un understand that the Eucharist is a truly communal event in which we respond to the Lord's extraordinary gift of himself to us by becoming what he calls us to be, the body of Christ. As you can appreciate from this very brief survey of the history of our Eucharistic celebration, one that hasn't even really touched the Christian East, uh, what Pope John Paul II called the other lung of Christianity, uh, you know, the Byzantine and other rites, which have such an extraordinarily rich tradition. Uh, as you can see from our brief survey and quick survey, uh, the Eucharist has indeed changed quite a bit in the course of 20 centuries. But it's fair to say, I think, I hope, that in its essentials, from the time of that first description from Justin Martyr in the second century, in its essentials, the Eucharist has remained very much the same. For 2,000 years, Christians have gathered around the revealed scriptures in order to offer their prayers confidently to the God who gives us life. In response to the proclamation of these scriptures, they have imitated the Lord's own acted prophecy of his passion, death, and resurrection by taking bread and wine, blessing God for them in the great prayer of thanksgiving, the Eucharistic prayer, breaking the bread and sharing the consecrated body and blood of the Lord so that they might become part of him. Or in the beautiful words of St. Augustine that we reprinted uh, in the uh, recent issue of Church 21 Resources from uh, Sermon 272, the great sermon uh, on the Eucharist, the words of St. Augustine, that they might become what they receive. And then, propelled by that holy word of God and by that gift of Christ's own self, they are sent out, we are sent out, on mission to be the body of Christ for a world that so desperately needs him. Who indeed, who indeed could doubt that this Eucharist, whether in the second century, the fifth, the 13th, 
the early 20th or the 21st, who could doubt that this Eucharist is truly the center of our Christian lives? Thank you for your attention.